please join me in <laughs> opening prayer. Father, we thank you so much, dear Lord, that you brought us here safely. We thank you for this privilege that we can pray together, we can honor you and worship you. We go, we ask you to guide whatever we say here today, whatever we do, let it be to praise you and honor you. And we ask for your guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, brethren. Good morning. I thought I got away. This message was to be that day when we were slipping and sliding a couple of weeks ago. But because Pastor had had that funeral to attend to, the loss in the family, he asked me last week, since you were already prepared, could you please do the honors? What can I say? You know, our Lord works in mysterious ways, and sometimes when we Think like Jonah, we got away, we are on a different area. It's only for that season. So my friends, today, what I have for you is, is a face. You know, I, I think I gave this sermon many, many years ago. But I noticed over the years, while I was doing a re-study, there are so much more things that reveal itself and today I would like to share it with you. I want to deal with Matthew 22 verses 1 through 10 and the title is called The Parable of the Wedding Feast. So I want you to sit back, relax because we are going to attend to some information that we know is a blessing from the Lord. Now, I'm going to read the 10 verses and then we're going to dissect it. Because just reading these verses, it's just like a novel, you know, it's beautiful words, but what is the lesson? What is the meaning? Why did Jesus speak in parables? So I'm going to do my best and let God do the rest. Now, in, now Jesus was teaching in the temple during that time that was about three days before he was crucified the chief priests and the elders of the people they were trying to trap him and they asked him where did your authority come from and in chapter 22 verse says 1 through 10 I'd like to begin by reading verse 1 and all the way to the 10th verse. And Jesus, I'm reading from a King James translation. And Jesus answered and spake again and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage feast for his son. 3. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden. To come One day, I have a, a bunch of notes here so you bear with me here trying to fit the pastor shoes is not <laughs> is not easy okay verse 1 alright this was the marriage feast for his son and he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come again he sent forth other servants saying tell them which were bidden behold I have prepared my dinner my oxen and fatlings are killed and all things are ready Come unto the marriage. Verse 5. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm and another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servant and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Verse 7. 
But when the king heard thereof, he was upset, wrought, and sent, and sent forth his armies and burned up their cities. Then said he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Nine. Go therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find there, bid them to come to the marriage. And in verse 10, So these servants went out into the highways and gathered all, as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. Now, I just read those 10 verses, but what is the sense? If I say amen and sit down, I don't think we are leaving with too much edification. So let us now begin to dissect what was taking place. First of all, if you notice, it was a certain king that gave this wedding feast for his son. And the royal state of the father and the specific designation of the festival as a wedding feast for his son. Now the father is described as a certain king and without any doubt this was our Lord's description of his father. Christ is the son. Psalms 72.1 and the dignity of his descent and the royalty of his nobility of his person we see implied. Now he was also the king as well as the king's son in Psalms 2 and verse 6. Now Martin Luther that is the the old minister have a comment that I copied. The king of the marriage feast is our heavenly father and the bridegroom is his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you notice in those ten verses the bride is not mentioned. Now but it is the bride is not mentioned, but the bride represents the Christian church. Now, everything that was ordered for the pleasure of his son, we can see here another vision of the Trinity. It was the king, the king's son, and the servant who gave the command for those to go into the highways and byways and invite the other people. Now John the Baptist referred to Jesus as the bridegroom in John 3 verses 29. Now we will ask the question why was the bride not mentioned here? Now the bride was not mentioned in the feast because Jesus' main purpose was to illustrate the full benefit of his gospel. Under the similitude of a banquet or a feast, the excellent quality of abundance and quantity and the varied character, enjoyment of which a multitude of guests must have great fellowship and happiness. It was one of those weddings that had to be a top notch and everybody had to be invited. Now in short, what we have here is a description of a spiritual banquet. Now what is said before us here is the blessings of the Gospels. And I was able to extrapolate in the search. The feast he has spread for us, it includes the pardon of sin, favor of God, peace of conscience, the exceeding 
great and precious promises of God, access to the throne of grace, the comforts of the Spirit, and the well-grounded assurance of eternal life. Now, when we look at the wealth of gospel mercies that is, it is presented to us, it is a feast of inconceivable delights in, and it is accessible to every man, woman, and child. To all who avail themselves of such a bountiful provision, there is a culminating feast, and it is called in the Bible the marriage of the supper of the Lamb. We're not going to touch that. Now, verses 4 and 5 and 6. The strange refusal of those guests to attend the royal celebration. Now, the king sent forth three invitations, yet all were rejected. Now, there is a special information that I got on the word bidden. Now, it is interesting and it speaks of a divine desire to have men and women participate in the divine mercy of God. Now, all men and women are bidden. Israel had been bidden by the long prophetic in of the approach of salvation. They had Moses, they had the prophets. And on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit came upon on, on the disciples that were gathered, that was a cue for the gospel feast. And every man, woman, and child were bidden. Let us now distinguish between the three invitations that were sent out by the king and delivered by his servants. <clears throat> Matthew 22, 1. Now, those that were invited would not come. The invitation was not repudiated or rejected, but it was returned. They were honored by the royal request but treated it somewhat indifferently. Now in the East, during the time of our, our feast, that's Excalibur, a wedding feast, their customs was to give a preliminary invitation to the feast, but not the exact date and time. Then follow it up with a definite invitation when the feast was actually ready. But those in the parable receiving the first invitation abstained from attending before the second one reached them. The second invitation was more explicit and urgent, Matthew 22, 4 and 7. Now the dinner was prepared and all things were made ready for the marriage celebrations. The father, the further group of the servants, however, they were not more successful trying to reach those folks that had the first invitation. And this time, they extended the kindness of the king and they were met with contemptuous mockery. Indifference became scorn, and they made light of it, and went their separate ways. Now, I have a note here. Their business interests meant more to them than any obligation to attend a marriage festival as the king's guest. Some spurned the invitation beyond neglect into bloodthirsty enmity. They entreated the servants spitefully and slew them. Now these two 
even these two invitations typifies the two false attempt of the Lord to win Israel. A. There was his own mission, for he was among men, not only as the king's son, but as the servant. He invited men to come to him. Now one of the important parts of the invitation is that third one that went out. This reveals the mercy seeking other objects in Matthew 22, that's verses 8 through 10. But those who were bidden, they were not worthy in that third invitation. The king's goodness was not quenched by the ingratitude and the evil of the previously invited guest. But the grace of God had been scornfully rejected by the Jews. His chosen people, they were chosen from the outset to be the first to lead the way. But because of the rejection, the invitation went out to the Gentiles, who were deemed by the Jews as being unworthy of theocratic privileges. They were deemed heathen. They were looked upon as heathen. But the Gentiles were the ones that responded to the cry of whomsoever will, let him come. The king's servant were to go into the highways and byways because the wedding feast was to be furnished with guests, both bad and good. Now, the servants were to gather as many as were willing to attend the feast. And the question comes up, why would they say bad and good people were invited to the feast? Now, in every section of society, we have two classes of people found, and they are distinguished by moral character described in ordinary language, the bad and the good, the virtuous and the vicious. Now, if the servants came across men in the highway who had no character, no moral standings, who were bad and knew it, they were invited to the field. If others were contacted who were good according to worldly standards, they too were invited. Now brethren, this king wanted to make sure, in spite of his rejection by his people, that wedding house had to be filled to the rim because they were having the finest of all things to be dispersed and enjoyed. Now in closing, once we get into the kingdom, moral conduct and standing is essential. But before entrance, no matter who we are or who we or who no matter who we are or what we are, we are all sinners and except we accept Jesus as our Savior, in His sight there is none good, no, not one. All have sinned and there is only one way to be saved. Human goodness cannot recommend us for God's favor. And the worst, like the best, are only welcomed through the blood of Jesus Christ. Once guests of the King, all are admitted to all the great privileges of the Kingdom of God. And the final outcome is, brethren, you and you and I 
are all invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb, which will culminate when he comes to marry his wife, the church. But I have a big question to leave you with. Would you accept or would you reject the invitation? I'd like to close by giving God a little prayer. Please join me. Father, we thank you so much, dear Lord, that we come to you, dear Father, not because of our goodness, but because of your goodness. We thank you for being present here with us this morning, and we ask you, dear Lord, to take care of us, help us to be teachable, and help us, dear Lord, Father, that we would tell someone that Jesus loved them, and they too are included. They are included in your feast. And we thank you for this. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.